It's a get great pleasure to KPFA to have such a distinguished visitor in our studios as Mr. Rockwell Kent, the American artist. And we have three other artists who are here today to have an informal discussion with him about art in the Soviet Union. Mr. Arnatov, Mr. Wessels, and Miss Packard. And uh, I suppose that uh, you're all just filled with questions, and uh, we would like to keep this as an informal discussion. It's not supposed to be uh, governed in any particular way, so let's just start with it. Well, I'm particularly interested to ask Mr. Kent what he saw, and he just came back from the Soviet Union. And since this is a, the latest division we've had there, that, that's what I would like to hear about. Well, before I attempt to answer any questions, I'd like to say that I'm a bit embarrassed at being uh, looked upon as more or less of an authority on what is going on in Russian art circles now. How long were you I've there, Mr. Kent, only, for the benefit of our audience? Only a month. Two weeks of which, however, was spent in an artist's house or home on the, uh, in the Crimea, on the Black Sea. There were between 50 and 60 artists, and we were crowded in there, and we saw a very great deal of each other. And I got to see them in their homes afterwards in Moscow and Leningrad. So what I know about Russian art is mostly based on what I have learned in talking with the Russians themselves. I got little chance to see pictures, but I do know pretty well what they're aiming at. Then you can tell us something about the uh, Russian artist's place in his society, whether he's... Uh, uh, is he free to express himself in the, the, the critical sense, the recent evidence would seem that he is not, or at least that he's uh, in disfavor when he does so. What is the freedom of expression, or what is the feeling about it? Well, you're referring, of course, to the Pasternak incident. I don't think we need to go into, into the merits of that case or of the book. At any rate, I can't because I haven't read the book. Uh, I think that was most unfortunate, and it surprised me because it was not consistent with what I had seen, what I'd come to know about the artists in general. Do they have, perhaps, uh, they're not under control of anyone. That I can say categorically. There's no boss over them. This is the, uh, is the artist, the painter, the pictorial arts, the plastic arts? That's what I'm speaking uh, of. Uh, yes. Well, that would be different then than the Pasternak case, because that, after all, was uh, in a different field. So I well, I would have assumed that they all had the same freedom and all demanded it. Uh, I don't know just how to explain what has happened there. It's the most unfortunate thing in, the, in its effect in public relations. Well, to get away from that, I think I could ask another question, which would pr probably satisfy, satisfy me further. What... Uh, how do you account, or did you find any reason for, the rather sudden change from the very early revolutionary art, which was constructivist and abstract in its nature, and the later art, which I saw in only one exhibition, which came through in later years, which seemed to me to be uh, a sort of celebration of the delights of living in Russia. Uh, and I thought at that time it was very similar to the celebration of the delights of living in Germany uh, under Hitler, the Kraft durch Freude idea. Is, is there a releasing, or was there any particular reason for that change? A very definite reason for it, and this is fundamental to the whole matter of Russian art today. With the revolution, artists not only in America but sympathizers uh, in Russia but sympathizers with that revolution in America I mean the New York crowd in Greenwich Village who who were for socialism and hailed the revolution as the liberation of man they all felt art now has been liberated the painter is free to paint as he pleases but in the Soviet Union public opinion and official opinion promptly put a stop to that. Instead of being free for the first time in your life, you artists, writers, musicians, everybody, 
like everyone else in the Soviet Union, has a, a great responsibility to the people. And out of that came the expression, a people's art. If you're going to function here, you must address yourselves to the people in terms of their understanding. No irresponsible self-expression, none of that kind of thing. We don't care anything about your expressing yourselves unless what you have to say is of value to people in this great period that we're entering of building, building, building a new country and a new way of life. In a way, isn't it kind of, uh, it's, it's war art, it was all war art, in a way, uh, the same way it would be in this country if we were under attack as they were, both uh, uh, spiritually and with actual armies, perhaps, and they had no time for, uh, shall we say, self-expression, as we would have no time during the war, we would ask our artists to, to do work that... Do you see what I mean? Do you think this sort is sort of a, a justification art, uh, an art which was in the service of justification of an idea? Yeah, to help to actively help the idea along rather than. What's your honor, Tom? You seem to have something to say. Well, I just uh, wanted to to ask this question: If uh, Mr. Ken feels that artists themselves feel that responsibility, that it is their mission to raise the general cultural level of the masses that previously to that were uh, denied and separated practically from cultural life. I mean previous to the October Revolution. They consider art as a means of expression, a language that can be understood by everyone. They think of themselves properly, as all artists must, what I guess do, as people who are endowed with special sensibilities toward life. They can see clearly, they feel more deeply, they're more beautiful, wonderful people. We artists all agree that we are, don't we? Well, <laughs> out of this, these special gifts that they have, fine perception, they, looking upon life, can bring the values of life that they perceive to everyone. They want, through their art, to increase people's understanding and love of life. And they say, if art can do that, it must do nothing else, because there's nothing greater that art can do. Well, what does this result in, as the only lay person here, uh, what does it result in in terms of the finished product? Is it fairly naive? Is it... Uh, uh, fairly naturalistic. Uh, what what type well, of, of thing terms that uh, used, do they feel uh, conveys this message? Of the terms that you've used, naturalistic is is most appropriate. They call it realism. But they're beginning to understand realism in a very broad sense, as uh, it should m maybe more properly be called representationalism. That's an awkward word, because their conception of realism now embraces. Uh, impressionism and all kinds of experimentation in a way in ways of representing light and nature because reality to them is what they perceive what they apprehend through their five senses directly uh, not uh, strained through the subconscious uh, no they're mind. not concerned with that kind of thing at all May I, uh, uh, did you come across in discussion that they are making difference between naturalism in, and realism in the sense that they consider naturalism is simply matter-of-fact presentation of uh, situation, when realism they understand as a, uh, they, uh, as a movement which has definite goal, ideal, so to speak, social responsibility to carry the education and enlightenment to the people. Well, I was made to feel or realize over there that a great change is in progress. We were made, have been made over the past many years, familiar with a pretty bad kind of, so, of Soviet art. I'm thinking of the the pictures that were reproduced in their finest art periodicals. You know, the pictures of Stalin and the generals and so forth, and busts of Stalin. In fact, uh, I forget the name of their finest art publication. It's a Russian name, and I don't Iskustvo. know what it means. Yes. Uh, that, uh, how do you say it? Iskustvo. Iskustvo? 
Uh, all right, that's the magazine I'm speaking of. It got sold a few years ago during the Stalin era that my wife and I would guess how many pictures and busts of Stalin and Lenin there would be in that number, and then we'd count and see who won. Well, on my recent visit, I spoke a number of times before groups of the artists there, because as an American artist whose work was exhibited there and whose work they liked, they paid me great honor everywhere. And I spoke frankly about their art and my ideals. I'm a realist, so you see, we were not far apart. And I spoke with, I spoke scathingly of this kind of stuff that they had been doing. And every time I did, I got a big hand from all of them. They cheered me for that. Mm. No, they're fed up with that old academic stuff. One might say, one who wants a fantastic experimentation in the arts, that they're still painfully academic. Possibly they are. But that is due to, am I talking too long at this moment? No, no. That is due not from the imposition from above, from any outside authority of ideas on the artist, no orders from anyone. My explanation of it is this. Their art training is a very careful one. It begins in fairly early childhood because those that show any aptitude in the arts are given special encouragement right from the primary schools, then in the high schools, and gradually through in encouragement and teaching and the passing of examinations, they are graduated into an art school or your art university. There they study all the, they study craftsmanship and painting because they have a great, uh, and sculpture, they have a great respect for craftsmanship. They study the history of art and because they believe there, naively maybe according to some of our artists, that artists should be educated. They teach them the humanities and philosophy. But they're advanced in their studies just as our students are in uh, in a university, our students in science and, in, and, and literature and so forth, by examinations in kind. They're judged by the work that they do, and the judges are the older painters. So you see, the, the judgment of the older painters is always selecting, 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 till finally those who get the greatest honors are those that meet the standards of these older painters most closely. Which so, makes the progress perhaps more slow it, than it would Well, be, I won't uh, say progress. It tends to make the whole, or change. The whole thing academic mm -hmm. and to carry on uh, academic standards that are more or less outworn. There is no chance then for a young artist as here, he might, to uh, short circuit this system as it were and to get public notice uh, before he had passed through this careful screening. He has a chance to do it. And if he can get any kind of backing from, let us say, a labor union, he's got to get backing from somebody who believes in him. But he's not going to get approval if he if he's too uh, if he departs too far from accepted standards because his professors, you see, won't like his work. That I think is easy for us to understand and uh, should explain why, though their art is does has tended in the past to be pretty uniform in its observance of old academic standards. It's not because government has said art shall be this way. Now, you said they accepted you as a realist. It seems to me, and I've long been an admirer of your work, that you are not, strictly speaking, a realist, but rather an interpreter. Uh, is there uh, evidence in their realism of a growing degree of interpretation? Yes, that's just what I meant when I said that their realism must now be understood in a very broad sense. Yes. And I just mentioned that they're very many of their painters are Impressionists, influenced by the Impressionist school. And now, let me go on this far, uh, a little farther, to show how much difference of opinion there is among the younger artists today. I had been in Leningrad to the, I think it's called the... Russian Museum, or the Leningrad Museum, not the Hermitage. And there was a very wonderful display, galleries of French art. The uh, Monet and Pizarro, the Impressionists, Gauguin, 
uh, Cezanne, uh, Van Gogh, uh, oh, what is the painter I want to speak of particularly? Well, never mind about him now. Oh, Matisse. And I spoke that night before a big gathering, a little banquet that they'd given me, of the art of the artists, the artists' union. And I was told of having been to see these pictures and how tremendous I felt Van Gogh to be. And I said, I'll give all the Matisses in the world for one Van Gogh. And spoke contemptuously of Matisse. And I, I don't like him, so, as I'm making clear. <laughs> and at that, a big strapping young artist got up and began objecting, roaring at me, shaking his fists. And he hadn't done this more than half a minute before half a dozen others were up attacking him. It turned into a free-for-all. It, afterwards, it, it, it looked as if they'd come to blows, but they all sat down and laughed afterwards. But I was sitting there laughing and said, when I get back to America, I'm going to tell about this to people. Yes. No, they differ widely in their ideas. And you, you can see one defending Matisse, and Matisse is certainly different from the uh, kind of Russian art that, that we've been accustomed to expect. That museum was open fairly recently, in the last few years. It was closed for a while, was it not? I don't know. Yeah, I believe, I'm yes. sure it was. Wonderful museum. And was I open understood uh, that uh, there was a period there of um, official um, kind of condemnation. Yes, that's phase, true. I believe right. in 1953 it was opened again after mm -hmm. having been closed, which of course is a good sign that they are um, becoming more free and more interested in, in uh, shall we say, the world, since that does represent the yes. other parts yeah. of the world. I have a sort of practical question to ask. When uh, a man finishes his training, or a woman, uh, how are they absorbed into the society? I mean, uh, what does an artist do? Does he, as he does here, have to make his living usually some way, he's other way, in order to stay alive, at least until he's established himself? What is what is the method of of handling? He's it? the most fortunate artist in the world. American artists maybe we'll all be turned into revolutionists and overthrow our government by force and violence in order to establish something like that for themselves. No one who is finally qualified as an artist and accepted into the artist's union ever has to worry about his living. He gets a basic living that takes good care of him and a studio that for virtually his life, as long as he keeps on functioning and painting. He's expected to keep on working he sets for himself a program. It isn't assigned to him. He says, I am going this year to paint certain subjects and I will paint, I guarantee to paint so many pictures. It doesn't have to be a great many. Some paint fast, some paint slowly. But that's his project. He's got to complete that. Those pictures become the property of, well, I don't know now whether it's the union or the government, they be, it becomes their property. All that he paints beyond that are his own, and he can sell them. And some individuals, especially the intellectual classes there, are quite well off enough to buy pictures. Or it can be they'll be bought by unions or organizations of one sort and another. Or uh, he will be commissioned to paint murals or to design and superintend the making of mosaics. One friend of mine has completed one beautiful mosaic in the Leningrad subway, an enormous thing, as large as that wall, larger than that wall of this studio, and he's at work now, or rather the, the artisans are at work, carrying out another uh, mosaic that he has designed. And they get a great deal for that money, for, for what they do. Uh, let me tell you, fellow artists, this will upset you as it did me. They bought two pictures of mine over there. One is going to go in the Pushkin State Museum and the other is going into the Hermitage. Incidentally, at last, after the centuries, there are going to be two American paintings in Russian museums. Well, it came to a matter of price. Now, when I sent my pictures abroad, there are 55 pretty large paintings and almost 200 black and whites. I listed them all carefully put my top valuation on them, and then cut that in half 
for insurance purposes. Well, I was notified that they wanted to buy two paintings and a lot of the black and whites. And what would my price be? And I went into session with them down in Washington with the cultural attaché. And she said, well now, Mr. Kent, if you would sell us these pictures, we'd like to know the price. And she had the list there. I said, well, there are my prices. That's my valuation of the pictures. Oh no, you don't understand this. Those are, of course, your insurance values. But what you want for the picture must be much more. I said, no, my insurance value is just one half that. Then they said, look, you're not asking enough for your pictures. We expect to pay much more. And I said, no, I'm sorry. You've been very friendly to me, Russian people and the Russian government. You've taken my pictures over there, and I'd be ashamed of myself if I let myself charge you one cent more than I would charge anyone else. And then one of the Russians at the conference began to laugh. And I said, what are you laughing at? Well, he said, I'm laughing because I found out one thing in America. Art is cheap. <laughs> They're paid generously over there. Uh, Ken, we have an exchange show. Don't you think it's a good idea? <laughs> right. well, it's still, uh, I don't want to play devil's advocate, but it still seems to me that um, this business of contracting to turn out so many things uh, in the course of a given length of time uh, might in some cases interfere with a, with a, with a creative uh, person. We uh, did it in WPA, you know. Oh, yes. I it was, has I, to be done. It I has was to a be supervisor on WPA, yes. and we had to do it that way. In other words, you just say, well, I can turn out so many things. You come to an agreement, and by the way, uh, the New York, uh, many of the New York galleries do that with the members of their stables, as they do call they? them. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. they make a contract for so many paintings a year and give them a stipend for them. In fact, I mm -hmm. understand there's much more pressure on 57th Street in that direction than there ever was on yeah. WPA. I uh, might throw this in that I've learned that uh, Holland has recently installed a plan such as you described for the uh, subsistence of their artists. Well, have they? Yes. This is, I, I welcome this. I didn't know they did it in Russia. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, governments have subsidized the arts. We all know that Italian opera has become, has attained the position it has in the world because it has always been supported by the government. And that means, incidentally, not directly, but the support of the artist. Because when the opera runs, if the opera is going to perform, it has to have singers, and the singers will be paid. But while we're talking about the support of Russian artists and how they become uh, professional artists, I should mention a criticism that there are of it a fault in their system that the artists themselves are becoming aware of. They're training so many artists and putting them on their payroll for life, and lots of them presently show that they don't deserve it. They're not as good as they thought they were, and they're getting loaded with dead wood. The artists themselves say, this is what is happening. We don't know how they're going to solve it. It's, it will be solved. But that's the, sh the shortcoming of, of this kind of a system. Uh, perhaps they ought to train critics the same way they train artists. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh -huh. thinking that implied some kind of an outside standard of yeah. some sort that yeah. was being applied. Well, I think that critics probably do uh, have special training in it. They're educated in, in the university to be critics. I don't speak with certainty about this, but that is so much the rule over there that uh, they value uh, expertness in everything. It's sort of like killing off the enemies of a certain type of game. We're over on those deer because there are no cougars anymore. Yes. But maybe they need a few cougars in Russia. It's the kind of thing that you'd have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I he I've heard that before. I heard that from people who were in Moscow during the war, for example, that it seemed to them that the uh, creative person was given so much cooperation uh, in within the limitations that they were able to give it. Uh, that uh, they wondered even if it would affect the uh, uh, the ability of the person to to perform that that it was just a little too easy perhaps. Well, that depends on the person. Some wouldn't do much if they were so well taken care of. Some need adversity, and others thrive with prosperity. And among the great painters of the world, there are many examples that can be cited on both sides. At least their system is a denial of what has been said here so often, that an artist should starve to do his best work. 
and we see to it that most of them do starve unless they get jobs outside. Isn't that true, fellow artists? That's true. According to a survey we made in this area, they're all uh, either supported by someone else who is working or do odd jobs, or I think 40% of them teach for a living, which yes. cuts down their time of painting. Well, actually. I was asked a great deal about American art over there and how artists live. Mm -hmm. And they were quite shocked when I told them this. Uh, actually, I think that uh, perhaps the teaching professions is being put in a bad light here. Some of us find it a very stimulating way of earning a living and find time to paint also. Mm -hmm. But well, I there are those who do, old. but many, many don't, and uh, I'm one of them, but there are many like me. There are some very creative teachers, of course, who paint also a great deal. But it should not be something that you have to depend on for a living. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, I understand from uh, Victor Arnatoff that uh, we're going to receive, uh, in exchange for some graphics we sent to Russia with Bufano, uh, an exchange show of Russian graphics. Uh, and what sort of thing do you think, Mr. Kent, we will expect to see? Um, I think you'll see illustrations. You see, book publishing is a tremendous activity in the Soviet Union. The people have become literate almost overnight, and they're eager to read, as no people maybe before in the history of the world are eager to read. The, the, pub, the editions of books just pass belief, and most of them, or many of them, are illustrated, and some of their best artists are illustrators. I think that the black and white artists, the graphic artists of the Soviet Union, are the best in the world. The best people go into it. Well, and the I graphics are more mm -hmm. interpretive, perhaps, than the paintings, you think? Less academic, or, or, uh, you know, or what would you say? Was there any difference in the... Well, well why, is the, why is the excellence in this particular area? It would uh, seem to me to be... Well, I think they've achieved a skill and a freedom in book illustration. Maybe there wasn't the precedent to follow. Maybe it hasn't been so academically controlled. But I think it's, it's very beautiful. It, they're, they're wonderful caricaturists. Do you remember the Cooker Nixie cartoons during the war? Those three uh, friends who worked together, they're still working together. Uh, those, well, in speaking over there, and one of the Cooker Nixies, Sokolov, was present. Uh, I said that uh, he, no, Stalingrad, finished Hitler, and Cook, the Kukranixi finished Goebbels. Do you remember his pictures of Goebbels, their yeah, pictures of Goebbels? Yeah. Yes, those ripping. were marvelous cartoons. Well, they go from that to perfectly beautiful, warm uh, illustrations for their classic masters, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and so forth. Really very beautiful things. And I'm advocating an exchange on a big scale of American graphic art well, the Russians are Russia. then very interested in seeing what we're doing, are they? Oh, they're tremendously interested in America. I understand the few we did send were, were caused a great deal of interest in Moscow, although we didn't even know they were going to be shown. Mm. They were shown, and, and were, I was told that the public wanted to see more. Well, they're, pardon me, they are going to be shown in the uh, latest communication that we have that is going to be shown in the Pushkin Museum. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh huh. This is, going this is a very small down. group, of course. Um, you think they would like to have a big one? Probably. Oh, I would like to see a tremendous collection. Do you uh, think the United States? Uh, uh, you think we could? Uh, I'm sure we could profit by a, an exhibit, and I hope to, uh, that this is going to come in the spring. Uh, well, I, I have no idea what size it will be. However, I would like to see a tremendous exhibition come over here and be shown in the greatest museums in our, in our major cities, in the mm -hmm. Metropolitan in New York, the Chicago Institute there, the Cochrane Gallery in Washington, and your gallery here, and, and Los Angeles. I it would be interesting to see whether the same reaction that uh, the Moiseyev Ballet received here, whether the graphics would receive a similar or a very different reception. It would be interesting to see whether some of our painting would receive the same acclaim as our jazz did in Russia. <laughs> Yes, well, yes, that the paintings of, of one American artist about whose work I can speak with some authority have received just unbelievably much acclaim in the press, in 
magazines, the first time that art, pictures of art, have ever been reproduced in uh, Pravda, were the pictures mm -hmm. of this American's art. Six weeks ago, 500,000 people had visited the exhibition. When this artist of whom I am talking was in Keith, the exhibition was there. Everyone knew him and uh, was happy to bow to him, recognize him, shake his hand. By everybody, I mean the maids in the hotel, the doorman of the hotel. Excuse me, I've got to... <coughs> frog in my throat. <coughs> Children in the park. I'm making it in the third person. He was walking there one day with his interpreter and his wife, and some children came up with buttons. They wanted to swap for foreign coins. They're not beggars. They don't want money. If you give them, offer them Russian money, they no, they don't want it. They want to swap. <coughs> and the interpreter said, run away from here. That's, don't bother Mr. Kent. And they went away, and they had a little huddle and came back. These are kids playing in the park and said, is that Mr. Rockwell Kent, the artist? And she said, yes. And they went away again and then caught up to us. And they just covered my coat with these little things that they'd wanted to swap. We had nothing to give them, but they decorated me with it. Well, I thought, being a New Yorker, I thought in terms of New York, if Michelangelo himself should be pointed out to a lot of kids playing in Central Park, and said, there's Michelangelo. They said, Mike, Mike Angelo? We don't know. Joe DiMaggio we know, but we don't know Mike Angelo. <laughs> Everybody, all the people of all levels are interested in art. So when you spoke of, of uh, uh, whether our pictures here would be, uh, their pictures would be received here as the mosaic dancers were, I said no, because our people don't have that interest in art. They don't crowd our exhibitions. Over there they do. And the American show of graphics would be attended by big crowds of people. Somehow I, I do think, though, that, that, that a good show from Russia would attract quite a lot of attention here. Don't, don't you I'm feel that sure it would? I'm very sure that it would. I'm very sure Even if it uh, was a question of the fact that people went to criticize or, uh, you know, went to just out of sheer curiosity, I think it would uh, be uh, well attended and something certainly that, that if it uh, turned out to be something that they really did enjoy, mm -hmm. Could, uh, could be a very fascinating experiment. It could very well grow to the proportions of the Van Gogh show because I think everyone is very curious whether they're sympathetic or whether they would go yes, to criticize. Yes, they're curious. That's quite and true. And there have been big crowds there. I think you're probably no, right. Oh, enormous crowds. Enormous. Yes. 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 Another thing I'd like to ask about, <coughs> and that is the sort of environment that the artist lives in. Uh, I have heard it said, and it appears to me to be true, that the American artist is comparatively isolated. Um, that uh, people work by themselves a lot yes. and are by themselves a lot. And uh, uh, is, it, is there more rapprochement? Is there more uh, a social they idea the for together. the artist itself, uh, as, as a group of people? Yes. And, and is that fruitful, do you feel? Well, it is definitely so. You see this artist's home. It, there are several of them in the Soviet Union. This one had 50, between 50 and 60 artists and their wives or wives artist wives and their husbands, though I think they were all pr more or less practicing artists. Uh, there they were together, spending their vacation together, together all day long, together in the evenings, together on the beach, walking together. Then back in Moscow and Leningrad, uh, many of them live in great studio buildings, old palaces converted into studios. They see, I think, too much of each other, and I think that may be another reason why their products tend to be standardized. To be st standardized. This does happen in any kind of an art colony, mm. whether in the Soviet Union or out. Or Greenwich Village yes, in New York. Yes, exactly. yes, I think so. One question. Uh, 
is about art critics. Uh, what uh, relations there are between art critics and artists, if uh, there is any evidence that you could uh, bring forward? Uh, I, uh, from my experience of that show that we sent with Bufano, I saw few reviews, and they are not similar. They are emphasizing different things. Where was this? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we sent show to to with Bufano. Oh yes, and yes. And it was exhibited. And review of that show mm -hmm. was written by few uh, art critics. There. Yes. They were not very uh, extensive, but anyhow, it pointed that uh, art critics there somehow uh, ma maintain independence. They have I mean, great authority over they there. They do. Uh, I don't speak with certainty, but I'm, I feel quite sure that they have a thorough training, maybe as craftsmen too in the arts. Anyhow, they are thoroughly trained to be critics, not mm -hmm. as some of our critics. Oh, some are taken off the sporting page and, and assigned to go and see the art galleries and write about the pictures. Yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's it's true. It's true. Certain, yes. certain yes. ones I know. It interested me. I did see one or two of the reviews of our show, and uh, we sent abstract prints as well as realist prints of various kinds, and um, they were not critical at all of the abstract as one might think they would be. They, they merely said that this abstract print is in contrast with uh, so-and-so's other print. Uh, they are both uh, lively and so on. There, mm -hmm. there was no uh, condemnation of the totally non-objective prints that we sent. I'm glad to hear that. It's consistent, however, with their attitude toward, certainly toward Americans and maybe toward all outsiders. They want to be friends with the world. They don't want to say hard words about anyone. And they don't, even about their late enemies, the Germans, the Nazis. I never heard an unkind word, even in Leningrad, in the midst of memorials of what was done there, and, and in association with men that, that fought for the 900 days in that siege, and yet never a, a, a hard word. And to one who spoke of beautiful, he'd been brought up in Australia from infancy, when his family took him there to when he was 12 and spoke of wonderful Australian cockney, just like a native. And of course, he was 100% Russian and spoke, having lived there ever si here in Russia ever since, spoke perfect Russian. He was a Russian. But uh, we toured so, uh, Leningrad with him and went to, to uh, the Peterhof, Peter's Palace, outside of Leningrad which had been virtually completely destroyed, gutted entirely, set fire to, and which now on the exterior is so beautifully restored you'd never know that anything had touched it. But when I saw the model of what the Germans had left, they have a scale model of it, I said, my God, these people, how you must hate them. Why don't you? Well, he said, and I think he was expressing the thought of all of them, we want, to, we want peace, and you can't have peace if you hate anybody. They had great charity, and I, well, they, they want they friendship with us. They, they wouldn't praise it. They wouldn't be false. They're very truthful people, but they'd be sparing of harsh criticism. Yes, but now, uh, let's face it, the, the propaganda uh, that uh, is carried on uh, in Russia against uh, the Americans and about American warmongering and so on uh, is uh, certainly uh, there. There's no question about it. You can read your uh, press reports and so on. Uh, how uh, do you think the people just ignore that they, as being a function of government? Yes. Or, or, or uh, I mean, uh, what, what is the? Uh, how, how can they maintain this type of attitude against well, what is obviously an official line? Just as we have an official line in this country. I mean, in most of the press is anti-Russian and so on. Uh, wh wh where do you? I think uh, they accept it as part of the rules of the game of brinkmanship. It's the kind of sparring back and forth that is forced upon the government. I'm sure that they're loyal to their government, 100% loyal, and feel that it's doing its best in protecting their interests. And if that's the language of diplomacy, if diplomacy has become, has descended 
to the use of such vituperative language, all right, they leave that to their government. They're not interested there much in politics. They've achieved their revolution. They're building their country. They are engaged in the pursuit of happiness. I, I like to bring the conversation back more directly to painting, because being a painter, I'm not very much of a politician either. Uh, I'm interested in their conception of realism. Realism, to me, seems to be a terribly elusive word. Almost everyone has to uh, find his own kind of realism. And I wondered if there was a special kind of realism which they had discovered in terms of Marxist doctrine, uh, a kind of uh, a special kind of idealization of uh, the world which they see, uh, a kind of uniformity of view. Uh, did you find any such thing? No, I didn't find that. And I think I forgot to ask what socialist realism is. That term yeah. has always annoyed me, but I forgot to ask anyone what it meant. <laughs> yeah. what, how could socialist realism be any different from, from realism? How can socialist truth be any different from the truth? Yeah. They have the tr a tremendous respect for the work of Winslow Homer and Thomas Aikens. Mm -hmm. Those are the great Americans. And I've suggested that they an exchange be arranged through government, you see, in this exchange program of 19th century Russian painters for 19th century American painting painters. I think it would be more fruitful of uh, the purpose, of achieving the purpose of uh, cultural interchange, that is, establishing friendlier relations, than the sending over abstract abstract art of America and getting from them the realistic and admittedly somewhat academic art that they are doing. Mr. Kent, uh, don't you think that uh, the content of contemporary Soviet art, like content of their uh, contemporary life, is different from content in the past? After all, it is a reflection of reality, and reality there, socialist reality. And if art is a reflection of reality, it means not necessarily it changes styles like we change styles of the car every year, but it uh, simply reflects a different uh, reality, though looks of the people may be the same. I know that that is an idea that we have assumed to be true over here, that we want a new art to, to express this machine age in which we live. I think they inclined to feel, and now I'm really putting my own thoughts into their minds, they're inclined to feel that man has remained very much the same throughout all the ages. And whether he uh, works with his hands or controls a machine to do the work for him, man himself is essentially the same. Man's relation to the universe has been said to be the uh, subject of certain Asiatic arts, uh, would that broad an interpretation be put upon Russian? Well, I saw nothing and heard nothing over there that would indicate that they were uh, much concerned in, in so metaphysical mm -hmm. a matter. That is, consciously. Yes. If you paint landscape and figures in the vast mm -hmm. sky behind, that does enter into it in, in some degree. But the metaphysical speculation in paint that some of our painters seem to indulge in is not uh, found there to any great extent. No, it is utterly meaningless to, to them. The yeah. question that was most asked me repeatedly by artists, can you explain abstractionist art to us? And I've said, look, if the art could be explained, if it had, if I should say it had a meaning, or if I should say it was a means of expression, I would be offending our advanced abstractionist artists because they say it has no meaning and isn't supposed to have meaning. We don't recognize that art is a language of communication. And they can't understand that. And I couldn't explain abstract art to them because I don't understand it. Well, I think uh, the very lack of communication is precisely what we want, at least what certain people want here, 
And I think it's uh, uh, a good example is Drew Pearson's quote recently, where he quoted someone in the State Department as saying that the show that of American art sent to Brussels was chosen from painters who were under 40 years old. Because if they had been over 40, they would have had left-wing ideas. And so all the paintings went over were non-objective, abstract paintings, which of course could not communicate mm. anything either dangerous or not dangerous. <laughs> well, they, I, there were a number of artists that I met who had seen the Brussels show. Oh, really? And they, it, what they saw there was the basis of their asking me these questions. What do you make about it? And one way the question was put, how do American artists feel that they're serving their country? Mm -hmm. Uh, this brings to my mind that even the very conservative Berenson wrote a book once called The Ineloquence of Art and justified it. Uh, perhaps our difference is that they expect art to have a different message than some Americans do. Well, they expect it to have a definite yeah. message, mm -hmm. to be a clear, unequivocal means of expression. I think that none of us would hold that a purely abstract work of art would find the same interpretation if we're going to try to interpret it by any two people anywhere. Do you remember a few years ago when, wasn't it Fortune or Life, one of, that, um, one of those magazines, summoned a, a group of great critics and gathered them in a room and took a tape recording or stenographic record of their comments on certain pictures. I remember there was a, a Picasso that came under discussion and one said to me that is a very gloomy sad picture. I'm impressed by the tragedy of it. Immediately he's contradic contradicted by another who said no no this is a most joyous picture. I really think it, that very few people would be found to agree on the even the mood of a purely abstract painting. Yeah, uh, that's true, too. That's true, I think, at least largely so. I, uh, I, I suspect, though, that the same thing would occur if you played a piece of music that different people would interpret it in different ways, and I think the likeness between certain painters' aims and abstract music is apparent. But uh, I think we're getting away from Russia here, which we really want yes. to know about. I wanted to say something about the, the realism in, um, in Russia. I saw, I had a chance to see some of the realism in Italy as practiced by socialists and communists within Italy. And there, there was a great deal more um, individuality, it seemed to me, among the painters in their approach to realism than I have seen in the periodicals coming out of the Soviet Union. I think you're, I, I'm quite sure that you're, that I agree with you in this, though uh, the art that is, uh, appearing, being reproduced in Iskuspu. That's right. That yeah, means art. Well. That means yeah, art. That's <laughs> art. Yeah. In their, well, let's translate it. In their magazine, art is uh, improving all the time and a greater uh -huh. range in things. Uh, I think very worthwhile things will come out of it, but they are struggling against this academic setup and training and academic tradition and so forth. They don't want to be startling innovators. They have a great respect for tradition, strangely enough. They want a continuous, uh, they want the tradition of the past to merge into the, uh, into the arts of the nearer past and still be carried on in the art of today, never Of course, that loose. same pattern uh, uh, holds in the United States uh, in sometimes very comical ways, I'm sure there's going to be a Cape Cod moon rocket because there are Cape Cod uh, aluminum trailers. There, our ancestors have gone straight through much of our industrial design and, and architecture. We still have Greek temple banks and so on, which is exactly the same thing as has happened in Russian art. Yes. They wanted what the Tsar had. The people, when yes. they got control, wanted exactly what the rich mm -hmm. people had had. And it's also true here. It's true, I think. Uh, now, about my art over there, or I put it in the third person, about the art of this American painter over there, they, they're critics. Uh, 
pointed out that it was in the American tradition. They recognize our tradition of realism, as I said, by Homer and Aikens and so forth. But there's another thing, if I may change for a moment, that I know that you are interested in, and that is how much uh, right does the artist claim to paint as he pleases, write as he pleases, and so forth. He claims a great deal, though the Pasternak uh, episode would seem to indicate that he can't always get away with it. I was asked to write a number of articles, always paid for them, too, because you can't do anything for nothing over there. If you speak on the radio, oh, this is a good idea to tell you about. If you speak on the radio over there, they hand you a good, fat envelope full of rubles, and when I said, I'm a guest here, I don't want to be paid for this, they said, no, this is a socialist country. We don't let anybody do anything for nothing. Well, <laughs> I wish we were in a position. I, I, that, that is a long sidetrack. I'll come back to what I was saying. I was asked by one editor, a woman, to write an article. She told me more or less what, this, what it was about. I think it was about American art. Not necessarily contemporary art, but the art of the past and and to try and explain the transition from, from American realism into what we have today, the abstractionism. And I wrote her the article. Incidentally, I was warned, look out for that woman. She's going to be difficult to deal with. I wrote the article. It was several pages, typewritten pages. We carried a typewriter with us. And two days later, she came, came to me, and I was sitting with a little group of the artists in this home. And she wanted to talk with me. My interpreter was here. And she had blue penciled whole paragraphs, changed sentences, cut out sentences. And I said, no, you can't do that. I won't let you change anything. Oh, yes, she pled with me. I said, all right. And I picked the thing up and went through the gesture of tearing it up. I said, I'll tear it up. It's all right with me. You don't have to take it. Oh, no, she wanted it. She took it and it was translated and printed as I wrote it. But all the artists were indignant. You were perfectly right. Don't put, don't stand for anything of that sort. You see, they're not, they're not the subservient people that, that they've, they, they've been misrepresented as being occasionally here. At, now, may I go on? Yeah, I don't want to hog the floor. But there's another thing. That uh, business of censorship of the art from the well, by the Communist Party, by by the, the political leaders. Remember the episode of a few years ago when some of the musicians, in, including, uh, uh, well, the top Shostakovich, Shostakovich, yes, were censured for doing uh, art that was music that was not for the people. All right, they may have been completely wrong in their criticism. But they did, at the same time, the greatest honor to music, to art, that I think any government, any people has ever done before. They recognize that it is vital to the people and is therefore properly subject to control. Just as in this country, we have our Pure Food and Drugs Act. We won't let people eat poisonous food or anybody purvey it to them. And over there, they hold that art is vital to the people and they don't want poisonous art purveyed. I think the idea was fine. Whether it is good in practice, I don't know. Though the musicians, without any detriment to their work, I believe, accepted the criticism. Uh, the question I was about to ask, uh, I would like to go back again to the liberal training that goes along with the professional art training. This interests me very much because uh, it seems to me that one of the faults of the, in American art training is a rather over-specialization, which mm -hmm. may in turn lead to a kind of obscurity in American painting. It seems to me if the artist had a breadth of social vision, and I don't mean necessarily a communist vision, uh, that uh, we would have more understandable art. I'm interested in knowing how they're trained. Well, as I said, they're educated in philosophy, probably in, probably indoctrinated with uh, socialist economics, imbued with a spirit of service to their people. That begins in childhood. That is done in what are called the pioneer camps. They're called pioneer camps because these children are to be the pioneers of a new culture, a new civilization. And uh, 
very fine ideas, ideals are inculcated in these children. And uh, when later some of them become artists, they have that heritage already, and undoubtedly it goes through their subsequent training. They do feel that they must be of public service, not as an obligation, but as a natural way, uh, a, a natural uh, wish for every decent person. I feel it strongly myself. May I tell a little story a few years ago? No, only last year, a little over a year ago, I was on Nightbeat, a radio program in New York. It was under Mike, not Mike Wallace, under John Wingate. And he said, Mr. Kent, do you feel that an artist should engage in political activities and so forth and so on? I said, well, it's very clear that I do because I do engage in all kinds of such activities. Well, he said there was an artist on here last week, uh, he mentioned his name, I'd never heard of him, who said an artist should have absolutely nothing to do with politics or life, he should just paint pictures. And I said, I have a better authority than he. Pericles, in his great speech about to the Athenian people, in which extolling the blessings of Athenian democracy, said, we hold him who does not meddle in affairs of state. That is, he's referring to the Athenian citizen who does not meddle in affairs of state to be not indolent, but good for nothing. I, when I took up my brush to paint, I didn't quit being an American citizen. This is my country, and I'm going to function as a citizen. I think all artists should, and I think they'd be better artists if they did. I've finished my political speech now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yeah. that our the obscurity that is uh, so fond in American art right now, is, as I said, serves a purpose. And I think it was Ozan Font said that uh, profundity is often uh, confused with obscurity. And he says that's quite all right as long as the thought is secondary in importance anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think a lot of that is going on, obscurity, masking what is supposed to be profundity. Well, you're all artists. Uh, would you say that perhaps art inescapably reflects the society in which it finds itself? And that perhaps some of the uh, so-called obscurity of uh, modern art is a question of the confusion and uh, the danger and the hostility and so on I think in which we find ourselves? I think the very fact that our artists can feel no social responsibility, that they can indulge themselves in completely irresponsible self-expression is of itself a reflection on our society today. I, I won't, wouldn't say for one moment that abstractionist art is a proper expression of this machine age in which we live. I can't see any connection whatever, though I think in more subtle ways, possibly profounder, deeper ways, it, it's very uh, irresponsibility, social irresponsibility may be read as an, as an expression of our society at this time, a society that many people hold to be decadent, that certainly has its faults. We've got our, what, what is happening to our youth, what's, look at the unemployment in the country. I don't know whether we are very healthy at this moment. Well, whether one agrees or disagrees with any particular way of life, it does seem to be obvious that where a, a social uh, grouping, whether it's the medieval one or whatever, which is sure of itself and uh, profoundly moved by its own ideas, that it does give birth to, uh, to a, a, an art of a different type than a society in which all this conflict and cleavage is taking place, and perhaps that accounts for the... Uh, what you call almost the standardization of, of the Russian situation. Yes, Do you I think, think it had any bearing? I think, I think you're quite right. There that. is a theory yes. uh, uh, extant, Weringer, the German, is responsible for it, that in times of insecurity, the artist does turn to a highly stylized, abstract representation of things in order to give himself a feeling of grasping them, and that only at the times when he feels secure in the world does he represent it in it with any degree of naturalism. This is interesting in this connection, that's why I throw it in. 
you're getting into a field of philosophy that, uh, that I'm impressed by. I'm impressed by your remarks and find myself unable to judge whether they're right or wrong. It sounds as though it might have some validity to me. <laughs> well, it's, it's curiously related to what we're yes. saying. Of course, the extreme individualism of the arts is the only field left in which the individual uh, he's surrounded with uniformity and mass production through science and so on. It is the only field in which he can still be his own uh, thumbprint that is unlike anyone else in the world. That's true. I think that definitely we in, in over here have overemphasized individualism so that people who are not in any real sense individuals, who have no distinct personality, want to appear as individuals. And much of it strikes me as though a man wanting to attract attention to himself on the street put a hat on upside down or wore a woman's hat or dressed in some fantastic way to attract attention. Uh, there, there would be a difference then between uh, a real individual and, uh, and individuality as a cult. I think, um, I think that we just have to trust to luck, to trust to the judgment of our fellows whether or not we have individuality. I think that the one absolute quality that a virtue that a work of art can possess is personal integrity. It must be the man himself with no attempt at affectation, no attempt at copying or aping someone else. I believe that we are close to the end of our time, and perhaps uh, we could uh, hope that the audience will be waiting to see some of these exhibits that are going to travel back and forth and be able to judge for themselves the type of thing which is being done today in the Soviet Union. Thank you all very much for coming along.